Module 1 Review Foundation systems that are created by drilling holes and filling them with concrete are known as caissons. The thickening of a foundation wall in order to receive the concentrated load of a beam resting on top or this may be used to reinforce or stiffen the foundation wall to limit any further bowing is known as pilasters. In construction, a compressible material that stops air leakage through any gaps in the foundation wall and separates the sill from the concrete is referred to as the sill gasket. In terms of lateral support, for a typical residential home, floor framing and joists connected to the foundation wall would be a good example. Roll roofing is usually nailed in place and then it's overlapped. The roofer makes sure to secure the nail heads with plastic cement, which is known as either mastic or elastic cement. In general, the flashing on a roof can be shorter if the roof has a higher pitch. Roll roofing is another name for salvage roofing. The majority of roof leaks are flashing related rather than roofing material related. Dead loads are the weight of the building materials and the soil surrounding a home's foundation. The upward movement of a building, which can cause, as a consequence, cracks that may result in leakage, uneven floors, and even leaning walls, is known as heaving. In general, when a home inspector notices an open crack, the home inspector should minimally assume that things are moving apart. Next we look at the term piles. This refers to an alternative to the use of footings and are often used in areas where soil quality is poor. It is more expensive to use this method and specialized equipment is necessary. Telling the difference between concrete blocks and cinder blocks. Concrete blocks are smoother and have lighter texture than cinder blocks. Next we look at the term piers. Piers refers to columns that may be completely concealed in the ground, or they may project above the ground and do not always have footings. If you were looking at a sidewalk or a patio, or especially a driveway that was sloping toward the house with an unnatural slope, what would a typical home inspector assume? Well, they should not only assume, but see settlement of the home and would be suspect of the settlement. The type of cracks that generally occur early in the life of a building while a concrete is still curing refer to this as shrinkage cracks. The term honeycombing is next. This refers to large voids or bubbles that are found in poured concrete walls and are very often a point of moisture penetration or a potential source of compromise to the strength of that wall. types of cracks that occur in many hilly areas or where sloping lots are involved or where a builder has to cut out a portion of the original sloping grade when establishing a foundation is referred to as a differential settlement crack. If a home inspector observes large numbers of small cracks while inspecting a home's foundation 
This is generally indicating more movement than one large crack alone. The collar tie performs the same tasks as a purlin or a knee wall in a residential roof construction. A framing method that utilizes the floor joists of each story and rests on the top plates below or on the foundation sill for the first story is referred to as platform framing. If you were observing an elevated balcony or porch that was approximately 20 feet high, the guardrail that you should expect to see should be a minimum of 42 inches high around it. In general, handrails are required on porches more than 24 or 30 inches above grade. In general, 8 inches is the maximum number of inches that the rise should be on a typical residential stairway. Blistering is the term that refers to wood sheathing that may have been painted in the direct sunlight, thereby drying too fast. Another name for the base coat is the scratch coat. This is approximately 3 eighths of an inch thick, dealing with stucco. In general, weep holes and flashing will be found near the bottom of exterior wall sheathings that tend to be masonry veneer. Please note, most sidings tend to discolor if they are chronically wet. A home inspector's roofing inspection is not considered complete until the home inspector has completed an interior inspection of the home. Homes that have larger eave overhangs and wide soffits tend to have ice damming problems. When looking at a slate roof, in order to determine whether it's deteriorating, it will usually develop a whitish surface and then turn brown. You should know that chimneys require flashing at the bottom, top, and sides. The term saddle or cricket refers to the peak that deflects water and snow from around the chimney, preventing it from accumulating against the top side of the chimney. Asphalt shingles are sold in bundles, and depending on the type of shingle, there are typically three bundles of shingles per square. Cedar shingles are often sold in four bundles per square. The term square, or square of roofing material, covers 100 square feet. In areas like the Northeast that receive substantial amounts of snow, one particular section of the roof that should be looked at carefully for mechanical damage would be the areas closest to the lower roof edges. In general, weep holes and flashing will be found near the bottom of the wall where exterior wall sheetings are seen for masonry veneer. Painting wood in direct sunlight results in blistering most of the time. Module 1 Review.
Module 2 Review How far should electrical equipment be from indoor gas meters and from outdoor gas relief vents? 3 feet is the optimal answer. If you happen to be inspecting a service box and the fuse labels are facing at an angle which makes them difficult to inspect or read, you should not touch anything in the service box. That's a home inspector safety consideration. The greatest problem which causes most fires in electrical related situations based on everything covered in the course boils down to loose connections. The service box is the point in the electrical system where the grounding and the neutral systems are supposed to come together. Let me say that again. The service box is the point in the electrical system where the grounding and the neutral systems are supposed to come together. The main reason why a home inspector should note whether there are open knockouts in an electrical service panel box, in other words, why do we even care about this? It's because a fire inside the box would be more likely contained if there were not open knockouts. In most parts of the country, modern electrical codes require that the service drop wires be a certain number of feet away from the bottoms or sides of a window or door or even a fire escape. Three feet is the distance that we're looking for from the sides of a door, window, or fire escape. There will usually be three wires coming in through the service drop. You should know that there's a black, red, and a white wire, with the white one being the neutral. The neutral is sometimes bare. Let me repeat that. There should be a black, red, and a white wire, with the white one being neutral, and the neutral is sometimes bare. The collection of overhead wires coming in from the utility pole at the street to the point of connection at the house is known as the service drop. Next we're going to look at breaker sizes for aluminum wire. If you have a wire size of 12 gauge, the breaker or fuse size should be 15 amps. 10 gauge would be 25 amps. 8 gauge would be 30 amps. A 6 gauge wire would be appropriate for a 40 amp breaker or fuse. And a 4 gauge wire size would be appropriate for a 55 amp breaker or fuse. Again, these are aluminum. Aluminum should always be one size larger than copper. A drip loop is the U-shaped bend in the wires that allows water to drip off so it will not enter the service entrance. Home inspectors need to be aware of minimum height requirements for various electrical wires found in and around various residential buildings. Please know the following. 10 feet above a walking surface, 12 feet above a driveway, and 18 feet above a roadway. If a wire is poorly connected or nicked within a junction box or elsewhere, the resulting effect is typically overheating of the wire in that area. The main purpose of the service drop and the service entrance is to get electricity safely from the utility company to the house. The amount of current a 
wire can carry in terms of amperage is determined primarily by the diameter of the wire. Please note for test purposes, the service drop generally terminates at the drip loop. In a typical residential window setup, what separates the window from an adjacent window, in other words, a separate whole window, that would be known as a mullion. The part of a window component, however, that separates the glass panes or the glazing from one another is known as the muttons. Mutton is spelled M-U-N-T-I-N. A type of window that is only hinged at the bottom and may open in or out is known as a hopper window. Still sticking with windows, if you're considering a window installation, where would you find a drip cap? And that's assuming that you could see it. It would be at the top of the window. With regards to the inspection of a door that leads to the interior of a dwelling from an attached garage, your biggest concern as a home inspector would be to see if it is a self-closing door. That would be a safety-related issue. Thermal resistance of materials is usually expressed per inch of thickness. A term that refers to the transfer of heat between two bodies by direct contact is called conduction. In terms of showing your understanding of what relative humidity means, you should know that as the temperature of the air goes down, the relative humidity goes up. Thermal bridging was discussed in Module 2. Thermal bridging is a concern because not only does it cause heat loss, but it can also lead to localized cooling temperatures on interior surfaces which can lead to surface condensation. With regards to vapor barriers, you should know that vapor barriers are generally required on the warm side of most insulations. Home inspectors should protect themselves from dust when inspecting areas that can be dusty, such as attics. HEPA filters is an acronym that refers to high efficiency particulate arresting. Again, the HEPA and HEPA filters stands for high efficiency particulate arresting. The industry standard regarding how much vent area is recommended based on the ratio or percentage of the floor area of the attic for a typical 4 by 12 roof would be 1 over 300. BTU, or British Thermal Unit. One BTU is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Again, that's one BTU is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. When you light a match, that's the equivalent of approximately one BTU. When the wind blows,
blows across your skin or your body on a cloudy day. Your skin will feel cool as a result of a concept known as convection. The percentage of a house's ventilation that should be accomplished as a result of soffit vents is 50%. In other words, 50% of a home's ventilation should be occurring as a result of soffit venting. The concept that refers to times when air may blow through the insulation relatively easily and thereby dramatically reducing its R value is called wind washing. With regards to insulation, you should know that the trapped air pockets within the insulation does the majority of the work. Thermal resistance can be understood as the capacity of material to resist heat transfer. Let me repeat that. Thermal resistance can be understood as the capacity of material to resist heat transfer. A type of drywall that is specifically referred to as being fire resistant is known as type X. You should know that truss uplift can only occur in the winter. We use trim to cover joints or changes in materials or directions. The neutral wire should not run through a fuse. Only the red and black one should. Bonding. Bonding is the joining of two electrical connectors together, so electrical potential will be the same. That concludes our review of Chapter and Module 2. Module 3 Review Part 1 With regard to the supplied piping distribution system in a home, the easiest rule of thumb is that the longer the run, the larger the pipe diameter should be. You should know as a home inspector that shutoff valves are typically found upstream of the meter and upstream of the pressure regulator. If you find that a faucet spout is below the overflow or flood rim of the fixture, you run the risk of a cross connection. The term petcock refers to another term for the bleed valve found on the main shutoff valve. If a homeowner observes loud banging sounds in the residential plumbing system, we call this water hammer. To show your understanding of piping support that is used in residential plumbing systems which material requires the most support on a per foot basis. Again, in a residential plumbing system, which material requires the most amount of support on a per foot basis, and that would be plastic. If you were inspecting a home and there was polybutylene supplied piping, it would be grayish in color. Polybutylene is gray. Polyethylene is black. Copper plumbing should be supported vertically every 10 feet. Again, in most areas, copper plumbing should be supported every 10 feet vertically. You 
should know the term service piping. Service piping refers to the piping that leads from the city main to the residence. Please note that as waste flows, it should never go from a larger pipe to a smaller pipe. Waste should never flow from a larger pipe to a smaller pipe. If a home inspector observes iron or galvanized steel piping at a residence, it should be at least six inches above grade. Fossil fuel burning pilots or burners of a hot water tank, which happens to be located in a garage, needs to be at least 18 inches off the ground or floor. You should know that the larger the burner, the faster the recovery rate of the hot water heater. Also, hot water heaters that have polybutylene connections should minimally be 18 inches before it begins. So that first 18 inches should not be polybutylene, it should be copper. Evidence of a leak when you're looking at polybutylene piping would be whitish deposits found on the pipe surface, which often occur usually near the fittings. Next we look at crimp rings. Crimp rings should be one eighth to a quarter inch away from the end of the tube when you're inspecting polybutylene piping in a home. Again, that's one eighth to one quarter of an inch away from the end of the tube when inspecting polybutylene piping a home. The implications of having excess water pressure in a home is leaking faucets, leaking valves, and solenoid valve failures. Typically, water pressure in a home should be in the range of 60 to 65 PSI. When you're inspecting a residential dwelling that has plastic piping, places a home inspector should pay particular attention to are the areas near metal hangers. Cross connections are a possibility wherever the supply plumbing and waste can come together. In general, it's recommended that copper piping be supported at each floor level and at every 10 feet. If you were asked what the implication of an S-trap would be, the optimal answer would be siphoning. Lead piping has not, lead piping hasn't been commonly used since the 1950s. If you inspect a larger home that has two water heaters in place, you hopefully will see them connected in parallel as compared to being connected in series. Cold water is introduced into a water heater through the dip tube. The most optimal type of trap you should inspect in a home, in other words, the one we want to see, would be a P-trap. The term that refers to a vent that also acts as a drain for another fixture is called a wet vent. The main problems associated with vents that are too tall 
in most parts of the state, as well as points north and east, is that frost closure becomes an issue then. Plumbing systems where toilets are below the public or the private sewer lines, or any time that the waste cannot flow by gravity to the sewer line, you should look for sewage ejector pumps. The most common problem associated with the modern washerless faucets typically found in newer construction is that the plumbing system is more prone to water hammer. That concludes the first part of Module 3's review. Module 3 Review Part 2 If spillage is taking place, the best place to look for it is around the draft hood of the furnace. The most common gap piping we find is black steel. The item which is approximately three inches long found at an appliance connection for most fossil fuel burning appliances which is intended to carry any foreign materials in other words to catch any foreign materials before it gets into the appliance or the furnace itself is referred to as a drip leg. The item on a hot water boiler that is generally the only thing that makes the system's burner turn on or off is called the primary control. The normal operating pressure in a hot water boiler system is 12 to 15 PSI. Flow control valves prevent hot water moving through the distribution system when there is no call for heat. The primary controller, which is located above the motor, is the safety device, the automatic safety device installed on every oil furnace. It shuts off the burner if the flame should go out. Again, it's located above the motor. With a gravity warm air furnace, the way air is circulated is based on the concept of convection. If the flame at the burner looks good when the burner comes on, but then becomes distorted when the house fan comes on, this usually indicates that there is a crack in the heat exchanger. When inspecting a home, the home inspector should look at vent connectors and they should be adequately supported to maintain their slope. Most manufacturers recommend supports every four feet. With regards to color and flame conditions, incomplete combustion occurring in an oil furnace will result in significant black flame tips or smoke. If you are inspecting a home that has a wood-burning stove or a wood-burning fireplace, you should pay particular attention to the chimney of that home to see if there is a creosote buildup in the chimney. If the breast of the fireplace is thicker than 6 inches, again, if the breast of the fireplace is thicker than 6 inches, there may be legitimate concerns for the home inspector as to whether there's a problem with the draft of the fireplace. We would typically recommend monitoring for this condition. If condensation is causing a significant problem with a house's chimney, the place to look for the problem most often will be near the top of the chimney. In general, the generally accepted rules for masonry chimney heights 
is three feet above the roof line and two feet higher than anything within 10 feet of the chimney horizontally. Again, the chimney height for masonry chimney, three feet above the roof line and two feet higher than anything within 10 feet of the chimney horizontally. Metal chimneys always have a single flue. The most common expansion device in a residential air conditioning unit is the capillary tube. Sometimes a home inspector has a hard time determining whether a unit is a heat pump or an air conditioning unit. If the thermostat has an emergency heat setting, then you can be sure that it's a heat pump you're looking at. The evaporator coil is the part of the air conditioning system where Freon converts from a liquid to a gas. The outdoor coil is typically called the condenser. If you were looking during the course of your home inspection for a float switch when inspecting the condensate system of the air conditioning system, Assuming there was no auxiliary pan, you should look near the drain pan. In our part of the country, in the northern United States, there's guidelines with regard to the area per ton of cooling, which is considered appropriate. For the northern U.S., the number you're looking for is 700 to 1,000 square feet per ton. Again, that's 700 to 1,000 square feet per ton. And this is considered the typical area per ton of cooling, which is appropriate for the northern U.S. The lines that carry the refrigerant between the evaporator and the condenser coils, and then through the compressor and expansion device, are typically made of copper. The compressor is considered the heart of the air conditioning system. Again, the compressor is considered the heart of the air conditioning system. If you inspect a home and there is a ductless air conditioning system, which is self-contained in that it houses the condenser, the compressor, and the evaporator all in the same cabinet, we call this a single component system. You should note, with regards to refrigerant lines, the larger line typically carries a cool gas and is therefore insulated and called a suction or return line. Again, the larger line typically carries a cool gas and is therefore insulated, and we call that the suction line or the return line. Air conditioning systems typically move four to five hundred cubic feet of air per minute per ton through an air conditioning system. When a residential central air conditioning system is operating properly, the air coming off the outdoor fan should be hotter than the outdoor air. You should know that the evaporator coil transfers heat from the house. Again, the evaporator coil transfers heat from the house air into the refrigerant in the coil. When the evaporator is operating, the entire surface should be covered with condensation. During your inspection, you should observe the distance between the water heater vent and the dryer vent. And they should be at least six feet away from the condenser. Again, 
the water heater vent and the dryer vent should be at least six feet away from the condenser. Otherwise, you would recommend monitoring. If you are having a difficult time translating a model number from a unit's data plate into a system capacity, you could always refer to a copy of the carrier blue book. The part of the air conditioning system that pumps the Freon through a traditional residential system is known as the compressor. In order to determine whether the fuse or breaker is sized correctly to adequately protect the air conditioning unit and its applicable wiring. The home inspector would look to the data plate. The home inspector would look on the supply inlet to the air conditioner for a backflow prevention device when performing an inspection of an air conditioning system which is cooled by the house water supply. You would look on the supply inlet to the air conditioner. If a backflow preventer is not in place, our concern would be a cross connector. You should know as a home inspector that two or three flues are common in a home that has a masonry chimney. In a wood burning fireplace, the item that allows exhaust products to leave the house should a fireplace be operating and keeps the cold air out when it's not running is called the damper. In terms of flue liners for chimneys, aluminum should only be used for natural gas or propane. When we're dealing with hot water boilers, the item typically referred to as the shock absorber or air cushion for the system is called the expansion tank. When you hear shock absorber, think of the expansion tank. The most important safety device on a hot water boiler system is the pressure relief valve. When observing air bleed valves, you should note that they're located near the top of every radiator. Air bleed valve should be located near the top of every radiator. On an oil furnace, the barometric damper would be the equivalent to the draft hood on a gas furnace. Vents for high efficiency furnaces should be no closer than four feet from the soffit. The amount of condensation that a high efficiency or mid efficiency furnace can create after operating for only 30 minutes continuously is the equivalent of a quart of condensate. When inspecting a home, return registers should ideally be located close to the interior walls of the home. When inspecting vent connections, the vent connector should slope away from the furnace at a minimum of one quarter inch per foot. Again, it's one quarter inch per foot slope away from the furnace. If you see a heat pump installed with a gas furnace, the indoor coil should be installed downstream of or after the furnace. Sometimes you will observe as a home inspector scorching. Scorching on the front of the furnace's cabinet is usually the result of flashback or flame rollout. The fan for a typical furnace will click on at 120 to 150 degrees. Cold air returns should be as far away from the supply registers as possible. Again, 
cold air burn should be as far away from the supply registers as possible. When inspecting a home that has mercury bulb thermostats, please note that they must be leveled to work properly. Grills deflect air in one direction or another. You cannot modulate the volume of air through a grill. A register is similar to a grill, but the volume of air can be adjusted with a damper. Diffusers are often ceiling mounted and can be cone or pyramid shaped. They usually are adjustable. They usually direct air in many directions as opposed to grills, which direct air in a single direction. Plenums are the large metal connection areas between the furnace and the ducts. The supply plenum is just downstream of the heat exchanger. On an upflow furnace, it should be roughly 3 inches below combustibles. The return plenum is just upstream of the house air fan. In moving air through ducts, the goal is to keep the friction losses to a minimum. The more changes of direction there are, the smaller the duct diameter, the greater the friction losses. That concludes Module 3 Review. Module 4 Review. If a home inspector meets with someone and the client, for example, states that they don't want the house anymore, find a way to get me out of this deal so the sale is canceled. If the home inspector were to accommodate that client, this would be an example of the home inspector not being ethical. In general, the larger the home, in terms of square footage, the more costly the home inspection would be. We find that the best time to have the engagement letter signed by your client is prior to starting the actual home inspection. An example of an environmental related inspection, which would be excluded under Article 12b, would be anything relating to indoor air quality related issues. Please note that a home inspection is not a code compliance inspection. Again, a home inspection is not a code compliance inspection. Home inspectors, based on typical standards of practice, should not be providing a warranty or guarantee of any system component of the home. If a home inspector was walking through and noticed that there was some kind of a leak while performing their professional service, the home inspector should optimally make note of it in his or her report. The New York State Department of State is the entity that enforces the Home Inspection Professional Licensing Act. We call the main body of laws which regulate the home inspection industry, Article 12B, that's Article 12B of the Real Property Law. The Home Inspection Licensing Law covers one through four units. 100 hours of classroom pre-qualifying education is required. That's 100 hours. A total of 140 hours is required of education in general, including your infield work. Please note that the three professions that are exempt under subsection 444-J from licensure as a home inspector, providing that they're acting within the scope of their profession or practice, includes code enforcement officers, architects, and professional engineers. A New York State license is renewed every two years for home inspectors. Article 12b requires that a licensed home inspector provide his client with a completed home inspection report 
within five business days. Radon is excluded from the law. New York State licensed home inspectors must include his or her state license number on all advertisements, including business cards. If a state licensed home inspector pays a real estate company to list his or her name in the advertising as a preferred inspector and then pays for such referrals, this could possibly be referred to as a kickback. The main difference between suspension and revocation of a home inspector's license is that revocation is generally for at least one year. Violation of the home inspector licensing laws is considered a misdemeanor and a fine of not less than $1,000 is applicable. Should a person be subsequently convicted for a second offense of the home inspection licensing laws, the maximum penalty under Article 12b is no less than $1,000 or more than $5,000 per offense. Before starting home inspection, the contract or the engagement letter should be reviewed with the client. These are often part of the home inspection report. Judicial review is addressed in the Home Inspector Licensing Act. The State Supreme Court specifically is the authority that reviews a case should the Secretary of State wish to suspend or revoke the license of a home inspector. Please note that there are three types of reporting formats we have. Combination, checklist, and narrative. Examples of limitations for a home inspector would include temperatures that are too low outside that would not allow you to perform a test of the air conditioning system and all of its components. 